This episode addresses hard topics like eating disorders, sex, and mental health disorders, so it may not be suitable for young listeners or people on the path toward healing. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, man. Do I have a heater for you today coming in (laughs) super hot? Um, So like right now we're in this series called For the Love of the Elephant in the Room. And the, the podcast team and I were like, let's do a series on basically uncomfortable topics we would prefer to avoid. That's it. Like things that are hard to discuss, things that are hard to admit, um, ideas that have a stigma around them in one way or another, um, they're, they're just super complex. And so today I thought we'd talk about divorce. Um, <laughs> and we do, oh my gosh, do we, do we it's like buckle up today, you guys. Um, so let's, let's just be honest. Let's back up a bit. First of all, nobody gets married expecting to get divorced. Right. But sometimes years, even decades into the relationship, like people sometimes find themselves as participants in relationships that just aren't working anymore. And sometimes divorce doesn't even feel like an option. Like even when the marriage has become complete misery, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but, um, or it could be that you, you were not expecting your marriage to blow up and you were handed a surprise. Um, you're like in, in somebody else's fallout of their decision. That wasn't something you saw coming. Um, but however it occurs, divorce, it is deeply devastating to each of us personally. And then of course it fans out and affects everybody that's integral to the relationship as well. Like the kids and our, our grown siblings, both sets of parents, um, in-laws, f- the friend group, Maybe it's like your faith community or whatever your little sub community is. Uh, it all just gets real sloppy and really confusing. And there's not like a playbook through this. And there's, there's also so many decisions that have to be made. Who lives where? Who gets what? How, legal, financial, physical. It's just so, it's endless. Oh my gosh. It's so endless. You watched me do it last year. Um, and then there's this whole like elephant in the room aspect, which is, feeling awkward or embarrassed or humiliated or like a failure when a status that has been so prominent in our life and to who we are dissolves. Like, and for some of you, like if you're a person of faith, how, what's this going to mean in your place of worship, um, in your, in your little religious community or whatever? Um, how do you tell people in your office, that your plus one has vacated the position. Who's now your emergency contact? Um, do, do, do I keep your last name? Um, how do we manage all of our people's disappointment and frustration and confusion, right? It's a lot, okay? It's just a lot. It's a real identity shaker that is super unique and it, it will upend your world in many different ways. Um, so listen, if no one has ever told you this or acknowledged this for your life, no matter what precipitated the breakup of your marriage, it is traumatizing, okay? Even if you made the choice, even if you made the good and the right choice, it's just, there's so much personal and societal impact um, and it's real. And so it is normal and even healthy to sort of be reeling after a divorce, no matter what brought you to that place. So what do we do? Um, how do we pick up the pieces? What lies ahead for us? What, what's the possibility on the other side of divorce? Because guess what? Guess what I'm learning right now? You are watching me learn this in real time. New dreams can be made. They can. New dreams can be made. And old dreams, frankly, can be modified. I'm just, I'm here to tell you, there is hope there is healing for all like intents and purposes. I've been divorced since last July. We had to parse out paperwork, but that was the last time I, we lived together in the same house. And from how I was living and managing my life last year at this time, really just to how I am right now, even let's just say one year later, it's so monumentally different. I, I, steered so hard into recovery um, in every way, financial, emotional, spiritual, relational, 
physical. There was no, there was no lever I would not pull um, to both process, not just my own like trauma around divorce, but my own, the pieces of me that were complicit, the pieces of me that needed to be reexamined, that were absolutely, um, they should have been revisited. Um, parts of me that I did not want to take into this next phase of my life, much less my next relationship. Um, and so a lot of this was internal. Some of it was external. It was physical. I had body healers. I had it all. I put every single possible thing in the soup pot and just stirred. I'm like, okay, we're, we're doing this. And I have emerged part. One of the things I put in the soup pot, this is a huge ingredient, actually. It's, it, it's, it's outsizes a lot of the other ones, but we're my, my people, my friends. Uh, my, my, the, my friends who love me, um, they did so much heavy lifting for me that I could just like sit here and cry my eyes out. Um, I'll never forget as long as I live. Uh, my friends picked me up off the floor in my darkest moments. And they have walked me and even shaken me back to life. Um, they comforted my kids and made safe spaces for them. Um, and they just made it, they made it all so much less lonely because divorce feels so lonely. Um, and so I've talked at length about a group of friends of mine and we all, the internet made us friends about a decade ago. So we're this kind of like weird cabal of authors and teachers and, justice people. Anyway, we've, we've been through it all together. We all knew each other, every single one of us in our first marriages. And now three of us through our divorces and into new life. And so two of them are here with me today. So two of really my best friends in the world, Kristen Howerton and Jamie Wright are on the show today. So just quickly, cause they're going to kind of, they're going to intro themselves a little bit for you here in just a second, but, um, you may have just recently remembered Kristen. She was a part of one of our recent book club episodes. And you've heard me talk about both these girls a billion times. Um, she's one of my favorite people on this earth. So in, in addition to being a tip top friend to me, she's a therapist, she's a mom, she's a podcast host. And Jamie is just one of the, my, literally my favorite people in the whole world. Um, she is also an author, um, an incredible like justice seeking person in the world in all the best ways. And she's such a dear friend to me. Um, and we are all divorced and we have all lived to tell the tale. So that's what we're talking about today. Listen, if, if divorce is not something you have faced at all, if you're a happily married person, you should still listen to this episode because people you love will go through this if they haven't already. This is usable information for every single person that is uh, in a relationship with anybody else right now. And so uh, maybe you're happily married. Maybe um, you are staring down a divorce. Maybe it's just something in your mind. Maybe you're in the middle of it. Maybe you're just after it. I don't know. But this conversation will serve you no matter what, wherever you're on the spectrum. Um, and it may just help you serve yourself and it may help you serve someone else, but either way you are getting the full deal today. The the hard truth, the real stuff. We're going to tell you how we, what we got right, what we got wrong, um, how and when and where we were still hiding in plain sight. Uh, we kind of laid it bare. Delighted to share with you two of my faves in the whole world, um, Kristen Howerton and Jamie Wright. What's taken us so long to get the three of us on a podcast, by the way? <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> like, no. I think because we are busy, <laughs> we are busy, mm. busy women with actual lives. That's, that's one theory. Um, although I did just say, I just kind of pissed away my morning until all of a sudden I was like, I need to shower. So super busy. Um, <laughs> well, too busy to shower. That is indicative of a busy. Thanks. Life. Yeah. I'm going to say, I'm going to go with that. Or bedtime um, management. I don't know. Uh, both, uh, guilty on both charges. Um, thanks for being here today. You guys, this is, it's funny. We're about to have a conversation in a public way that we have had a million hours together behind closed doors, 10 yep. million hours, 10 years. Like, yep. I think I'm rounding up right now, but I, I we're at the 10 year mark, right? Yeah. Pretty close. 10 years. Um, and so 
obviously today we're going to talk about what it means to be divorced. Like at our ages, we're all the same ages, right? Are we all 47? Yeah. I, yeah. I think I'm 46 actually. Oh, fine. Oh, yeah, I'm 46 too, but I don't know. Oh. <laughs> but I'm almost 47. It's okay. Coming. That's fine. Very close. We're more or less the same age and our stories have so much overlap, which we're going to get into. Um, but it's a deal you know, we've, we've now endured something that is a really specific life, life situation. That's weird for people to talk about sometimes, or even imagine or envision, or once you're in it, your own self, you're like, what the hell? Like, who do I look to? Like, who will help me through this? Who knows what's happening? But I wonder if, um, you can just sort of roll out a bit of, of an introduction to my listening community. Um, tell a little bit about your history, um, and kind of go, go high level. If you're comfortable sort of leading up to your divorces. So in other words, this is who I was. This is kind of when I got married. Um, this is who we added to the mix, um, and kind of just set the stage for us to kind of talk about what it looked like for each of us to begin the, um, experience of divorce. Jamie, do you want to go first? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, probably unlike you and Kristen, Mm -hmm. I was a bit of a wild child. I was, Mm -hmm. did all of my crazy stuff in high school. I mean, literally like 13, 14, 15 years old, got all of the sex and drugs and crazy out of my system. Um, and then I met a boy when I was 16 and got pregnant when I was 17, (laughs) had that baby married that boy at 18. Sure. And, um, you know, we, we just did the thing. We, had two more kids. We bought a house in the suburbs. Yeah. He was a cop and I was yeah. a stay at home mom. And it was like, this is the life. This is the yeah. life that you just kind of dream of when you're, when you're, you know, I don't know, a kid, you just think, yeah. oh, this is what I want. I want to grow up and I get married. I want to have my family. I want to have a cute little house. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we went a step further and we got real involved in church when I was probably in my early twenties, like, like 20. And I sold out so hard yeah. for, I would say not even so much for Jesus, but for like mm. evangelicalism, for like yeah. being in the church, for being part yeah. of it. And um, so much so that 10 years in, we sold everything and became missionaries. So yeah. my yeah. husband, who was a cop, resigned. We sold everything and we took our three boys, Stephen, Dylan, and Jameson to Costa Rica, where we lived for five years as missionaries. Yeah. And then when we returned to the, the US, we... Uh, he took on a, a job as a pastor at one mm-hmm. of the biggest, like, you know, at a big mega church in town. And mm-hmm. I became a pastor's wife. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And we just did the thing and we, you know, we, we kind of kept going, mm-hmm. um, for 20, I mean, more than 20 years, but we, we just kept going. And all the while I pretended to have a really good marriage Yeah. and it was really bad. Yeah. Literally the whole time. I will say when I came uh, coming back from Costa Rica, I knew that I was going to get a divorce. You did did not know when, yes, Mm. I absolutely didn't know when, but I knew I, my hope was to get my youngest through high school. Yeah. He he had been through so much upheaval. I was like, we're going to get this kid through high school. We're not going to throw any more wrenches at him Mm. or in his, you know, gears. We're just going to make it work. Mm. And, um, but I knew that that was, Mm -hmm. that was my hard limit was once my youngest son graduated from Mm. high school. I've heard you, you've said that to us before. And, but what I haven't asked you is, did you have a vision for how that was going to end? Was it your sense of it? I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull the plug. It'll be me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I knew it would be me. I knew it would be me. I had plenty of grounds for divorce. Um, Sure. And I know that my ex would have been delighted if I had just, um, continued to roll along with things the way they were. Of course. Yeah. Disrupt nothing. Yes. In fact, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in in fact, we talked about it many times. Like it was, this was not a secret between he and I, I mean, it was something that we, I made very clear and it was like, Mm. he just would push it out of his mind. And Mm. if it came back up, he'd be like, but I thought we were doing so good. (gasps) Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we were never doing good. We were never doing good. (sighs) So you've been divorced maybe four years. I've been divorced, years. officially divorced for, uh, it'll be th- 
three, three years, I think in May, I was, I was married on paper for 25 years to the day. I got my divorce. Oh, paper. I did but, not remember that. I mean, I got my papers in the mail. So I got yeah. the pa- like the final papers in mm. the mail on, it was on my 25th, yep. would have been my 25th wedding anniversary. Yep. Okay. Kristen. It's just, it's funny because I got my papers in the mail on our 20th. Mm. Anniversary. Really? You guys, I can't about? believe I never pieced that together. Yeah. Well, happy anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> happy anniversary. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay. A little cry about that. Mm. Um, so I, um, I, I actually was a bit of a wild child when I was younger as well. Not actually that wild, but grew up very evangelical. Um, and so in high school, you know, really struggled with, I want to be on fire for God. Um, but then I also want to party and have fun. So, um, went through a little bit of a party phase in high school that involved me having sex before marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went to Bible college to straighten out. I, you know, it was like, I I felt like I needed to go to Bible college to get away from this kind of thing. Sure. And I also wanted to meet a nice Christian boy. So I went to Bible college, um, my first day on campus, I met my husband. So I was Mm. all of 18 years old. Um, And I went to a very, very, uh, fundamentalist Bible college, um, to the point where I had deep, deep shame about not being a virgin. Like Mm -hmm. that was my identity. Yeah. Well, you were, I was gum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a chewed up piece of gum. Rose stick with no petals. Totally. Cause Mm -hmm. those were the, because that's what I was told. Oh, I know. (laughs) Literally. You didn't make that up. Yeah. I mean, we learned that those were the messages I got. That's right. And so I show up to Bible college, just feeling like a piece of trash Mm. and a liability and just hoping that I can find a guy who is forgiving enough to forgive me for a thing that I did before I met him. Mm. And and that's truly, that was my narrative. Mm. And so, um, I met, you know, met a boy first day of college. We didn't start dating until about, um, I, a year later, but we were Mm. friends. I was very interested in him. He was very charismatic, um, very, which is a thing for me, big Mm. personality. um, One, two, three in a row. Yeah. 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 Very charming. um, You know, very interested in being the center of attention. And I I gravitated towards that. Um, And he wanted to be a youth pastor. And there was very much a part of me that also felt like if I can marry a pastor and if I can be a pastor's wife, that will take over the identity of chewed up piece of chewing gum, right? Mm. Like yeah, that, that will save me. That's like a a trump card. It it replaces. Yeah. I can put that costume on over top Mm. of the broken V card and, and be okay. And I mean, Jen, we've talked about the fact that we're both Enneagram threes and like yeah. perception was so important to me. And yeah. I just really wanted to be a pastor's wife that mm-hmm. felt like that external validation of me being a good enough Christian. So mm-hmm. when my ex and I started dating at the fresh age of 19, I, Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember very specifically on our second date, that was the date that I felt I had to disclose, Mm -hmm. you know, that I was ruined. (laughs) Oh, bless. And I remember just be like having a stomach and being so nervous and he accepted me. Oh gosh. (laughs) Forgave me. Um, not, Not very many men want chewed gum. So I know. Oh my gosh. Bless our young selves. <sighs> yeah. So, mm. and, and I just felt like, well, I got it. I got to take what I can get. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. and there were plenty of red flags. Plenty. Oh, sure. 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 And sure. It's so sad because I mean, I have on a bookshelf right behind me, all my old journals and my journals yeah. from that time. Like, you know, if I read them, I'm, I'm expressing concern. I'm expressing mm. fear about getting married. But, you know, it's just also littered with all of this sort of religious, like, I think God is leading me to this and Satan is yeah. tempting me out of this relationship. And oh. these doubts are from the devil. Bless. So yeah, we got married while I was still in college. You know, yeah. we, I had never lived on my own. Uh, right. We both got married fresh out of a dorm. I had never seen him live on his own. I had mm. no idea what he was like in the real world, how he would hold a job, how he would maintain a household. I had no no clue. 
mm-hmm. about any of those things. And as it turns out, all of those things were a problem. Like I, mm-hmm. you know, I, if I had given it a couple years and seen what he looked like as an adult, yeah, I think things would have been very different. Um, but yeah, so we got married, um, very young and then he did go on to be a pastor. And then I was a very dutiful pastor's wife. That was a huge yeah. part of my identity. He ended up working at a mega church. Um, but two years into our marriage, I found out some secrets that were very devastating for me. Did Things you say two he, years in two years in? Mm-hmm. So two years in at that point, he was working at a church, um, I was again, Enneagram three, very concerned with how things looked. And so I found some stuff out that was devastating. And I told Mm. no one, not Mm. a single soul. I didn't tell anybody um, because I was embarrassed and because I knew he'd lose his job at the church and we didn't have a backup. And this is a whole other thing too, for, you know, pastors, wives who find themselves, you know, staring down information that is not compatible with their husband's job. Like a lot of women hold secrets because what's the alternative, you know? Um, so we worked through it. I forgave, which, you know, I also, that was the messaging I got as well, you know, Mm -hmm. that you just forgive at all costs. But, you know, I look back on that, you know, 22 year old girl who was just so alone. And just, yeah. I wish that I'd had the strength then hmm. to go, okay, you've shown me who you are. Hmm. This is not, you know, this is not good, but we, we yeah. continued on. He continued working at that church. He worked there for over a decade. Um, we, you know, we had four kids two adopted two bio. Um, and, I just think it took me a very, very long time to have the strength to look at the issues that were inherent in our marriage and say enough, you know, this is enough. And really it happened, um, uh, as a result of me being in my own personal therapy and getting Mm -hmm. training on boundaries and, um, and then ultimately deciding because I had always been the one kind of keeping the marriage on track. And when there were problems, I was always the one making the counseling appointments, making the Mm -hmm. date nights, like really working on the marriage being doable. Yeah. And I just remember a point where I, and my therapist was like, what, what would happen if you got off that hamster wheel? What Mm -hmm. would happen if you stopped working so hard? You know? And I was like, well, let's see, let's see what happens. And what Mm -hmm. happened was it fell apart. (laughs) Yeah. Fell apart. And when I started having boundaries, it was real ugly. Yeah. And timing wise, can you sort of locate that in the, in the story? Like when, when did, when was the beginning of the end and when was the end? Yeah. I mean, I think the beginning of the, of the end, um, gosh, was probably 2013, 2014 things were just we, you know, we were not, we were barely speaking in our home. We slept in separate bedrooms. Mm. Um, there was no intimacy there, you know, there was no dates. We were living completely separate lives and Mm. he was spending many evenings of the week going to bars, like just having a totally separate life. Yeah. I can remember, I think it was our 18th wedding anniversary. At that point, we weren't really speaking much. We weren't talking a whole lot. And I remember waking up and just wondering, like, is he going to acknowledge it? Mm. Like, you know, are we going to have any kind of a connection or talk? And he didn't at all. Um, I remember I spent that evening alone by myself at home and he came home and just went right to bed in his separate bedroom. And I remember just like crying myself to sleep and just feeling so devastated. And then the next day I went to him and said, you know, I cried myself to sleep. And I remember him saying, well, I'm not shedding any tears. Um, Mm, and you know, yeah, it was just very cold, very dark. Um, but at the same time, he was not, um, he wasn't making any move to end the marriage. And I, I felt a bit like I was being starved out. Like he wanted me to be the one to do it, which generally I have been in our marriage, the one to kind of initiate things, you know? Sure. Um, and it just felt like a game of chicken almost like, mm-hmm. he, you know, there was just so much distance and cruelty. 
Um, but he, he was going to sit there. I, I think maybe so that he could have the story that I left him. Sure. Um, sure. and that has been his story. Yeah. Um, sure. Yep. And that is the story. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I filed for a divorce, but, yep. um, you know, what happened behind closed doors was, uh, you know, an entirely different Absolutely. narrative, um, of just feeling like he was just going to yeah. Stonewall me out until I did something. I think worth mentioning here too, is that, um, we all know this about one another. And of course my story arc is super similar, super, super similar, super Baptist, super youth group kid, miss miss youth group goes to Baptist college, met Brandon immediately. My freshman year so we're, we're dating by October of my mm -hmm. freshman year, yeah. married the following Christmas. Yeah. So got married as a sophomore, midway through my sophomore year. A literal infant. A little a little baby. A little baby. Like a, I couldn't you drink. Know about I couldn't buy a beer. We were trying on a roll. You yes. know, like that was a, a bit of a caricature. Some yes. some of us more than others. Some some people in these partnerships were really trying on a roll. Like it was a brand new identity. Like let's just see how this hat feels. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then some of us were kind of groomed mm -hmm. to to play the role that we were playing, but it still wasn't genuine. It still wasn't authentic. And so at this pivotal moments, unformed, undeveloped, young, just young. Yep. Like we're just young. We're, yeah. I have all these ages in my house right now and they're idiots. Like so dumb. so dumb. They're just, and they're supposed to be because they're kids. Mm -hmm. Like at this pivotal moment, we made like a marriage decision. Yeah. And you know, you said something a second ago, Kristen, about, you know, had I seen this kind of play out, had I seen any level of adulthood play out in my partner, for even a little bit, we might have, we might not be where we're at. And it's yeah. just saying, we never were grown ups together. We yeah. uh, never, we were never grown. We just yeah. were kids who got married during a weird time. And so it is interesting to think what would have happened if we would have just given ourselves a little bit more time to grow up yeah. and to live. And then of course, uh, we're all about the same time frame. I, I was married 25 years. Right. Um, um, and then divorced last, last year. I, I essentially just say last July, last July was the end. Yeah. And then there was paperwork, but right. last July was the last day that we ever lived in a house together. Right. Um, and so for me in every meaningful way, I have been divorced since then. So a year and some months. Um, but what my point was about to be was all three of us had a very different outward facing story. Very, Absolutely. nobody would have had a clue um, what was breaking down behind closed doors, just the absolute stone cold, like lack of intimacy, the full disconnection, like just, but then, you know, here we go. Christmas pick everybody yeah. vacay pick, yeah. you know, it, and, and that made it so lonely. It's like a prison of yeah. loneliness that nobody knows you're in. And then you acknowledge like marriage is hard guys. Uh, you know, like we yeah. write a post, you write Little a post things. about like, we got in a fight, we fight. Uh, and then you, and then, you know, so then you're authentic, you're authentic, you're real, uh, <laughs> but it's all part of it. Like that, that we were groomed to protect men. Yes. And so mm -hmm. we just did that. We just did we what did. We was expected of us. All three and of us did it. Absolutely. And I, I walked into the evangelical church and I was immediately taught that I should forgive at all costs and yeah. die to myself. Yep. And I was like, oh, if I do those things, then not only do I get to stay married to someone who is habitually cheating on me, but mm. also yeah. I can be like Jesus. That's right. Like it gave me this pass to not mm. divorce someone who was hurting me deeply on a very regular basis. That's right. That's so abusive. Yeah. It's gen I, it's genuinely yep. so abusive. Yep. Um. So uh, we all have this very strange, bizarre world layer of being public women, which by the way, we already broke ranks by becoming public women um, and outranking ourselves inside of our own marriages, right? Like yes. we just went ahead and did that thing, which caused tension oh, yeah. um, for all of us. And um, so I think we were already kind of breaking the mold and I, our internal, um, just cognitive dissonance 
was just a growing, it was like a growing mountain. Divorce isn't easy, really, no matter what. Uh, it, even in the best of scenarios, it's still not easy. There's nothing easy about it. No matter how long you've been married, if we were like long timers, like we were, or short, it doesn't matter. I mean, even if, and I want to talk about this in a minute, because I want to put a pin in this, even if that divorce brings an enormous amount of relief, yes. right? Yes. If it's like, oh, the pressure valve is released and it is actually like the best thing that probably ever happened. Um, but really, even then it's still so much upheaval and it's still kind of traumatic. And so can you guys talk individually and we can talk amongst ourselves too, what it was like for you once the decision was made, like, I'd like us to get a little granular here because I'm thinking about the people listening right now for, or they're, they're, they're in a different space and they're like, how do you even get up the nerve to move into this, this space, if it's appropriate, if it's, if it's, if you're kind of in an abusive scenario or whatever. Um, so how, what was it like for you right, move, right there at the decision to become, um, divorced. And then just after, H- how do you tell people, how did you tell mm-hmm. people, how did you deal with the awkwardness of people's broken expectations around your marriage? Cause all three of us had marriages that were up on a pedestal. People looked at them and we let them, by the way, we let yes. them, we kept our pedestal shined up, <sighs> polished. Um, and so I, could you talk a little bit about literally what that was like? How about you go, Jamie? Okay. Um, so let me preface this by saying that my ex cheated habitually throughout our entire marriage. So it's not really any length of time, as far as I know, in which he was not either cheating on me or trying to find ways to cheat on me, you know, so obviously that was, that was not okay, but I kept finding ways to make it okay. I kept finding ways to make it my job to forgive him, my job to fulfill him, my job to, you know, like if I just meet his needs, if I'm just pretty enough, if I'm just nice Uh enough, if I'm just skinny enough, if my boobs are big enough, like whatever it is. I can, I can fix this. Hmm. Um, and so I just kept trying to fix and fix and fix and fix until I was so tired. Um, and at the same time, I also Hmm. started writing and started blogging. And while in my home, I pretended to be, I made myself very small and very like, I deferred to his intelligence, to his strength, to his masculinity. I constantly was deferring. And then online, all of a sudden people were like, Hey, you're smart. Yeah. You're funny. Like you have ideas. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's true. That's, those are, those are true things. Mm -hmm. And so that really started to butt heads with this role that I was playing in my own home, which Mm -hmm. was not who I am. It was just kind of this, I'm going to make room for the, this giant ego and this Mm -hmm. giant person, (laughs) you know, like Mm -hmm. this giant personality and all of this pain, I'm going to carry all of that and, and make myself small to make room for it. But then having other people say like, no, you have, like you have value. Hmm. And, um, you know, and I'm not a person that really puts a lot of weight in like things strangers say. Hmm. Um, but I also met people like, like you, like yeah. my, some of my best friends and people yeah. I've respected and valued and got to know. And was like, oh, these are like, these women know what they're talking about. And they're telling me I have this intrinsic value and that I have these things to, to offer to the world or to my family or to my friends, whatever. So when those two things really started to butt heads, like who I actually am or who I could be versus this kind of like smallness that I was carrying in my personal life, yeah, um, that's when I really was like, this is unsustainable. I'm not yeah. going to do this forever. I want to be loved properly. Like I want to be loved by someone who can love me. And I want to love someone who can, who can receive my love. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just keep throwing this out there. Mm-hmm. Um, And then I also realized that we had this dynamic in which he did terrible things, got caught, apologized, and then made an effort to not do terrible things. And it was my job to be grateful. Mm. It was my job to say, oh, thank you so much. You are doing such a great job. I am so grateful. Thank you for not cheating on me today. Yeah. And we were in therapy together one day and I was so mad. And the therapist was like, you sound really mad. And I was like, yeah, I'm pissed. Hmm. 
And um, so they were like, let's unpack that. And I was like, okay, let's, here's the deal. He gets to be the villain and then he gets to be the hero. Like he gets to be the, the villain who does the terrible thing. And then he gets to be the hero that saves the day. Well, mm. I, I don't like, who's my hero? Yeah. Who's going who's gonna to save me? And then I was like, oh, I am in therapy. I was like, oh, it's, it's me. I'm going to choose right. that. Yep. And I, and we never went to therapy again. That was, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be I'm my, hero. my own story. Yeah. Mm. Wow, and Jamie. it was powerful for me, yeah. but it also was so freeing. It was just like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to be with someone who has to try real hard to not cheat on me. And I'm sorry for whatever the root cause of, of, mm. you know, whatever his pain or his injury yeah. or his wound is like, I feel real bad about that, but I'm not going to bleed to death for you anymore. Yeah. Like, that's right. You just can't keep kicking me in the stomach. Mm. And so it was at that point, it just became really like, I felt centered and I felt settled. Yeah. Like I'd made a decision, Yeah. but I hadn't made a decision about when, because, mm. you know, we'd been doing this for so long. I was yeah. like, well, what does that look like? When will that be? Um, and his, one of the big threats over our marriage for both of us, really, it wasn't, he didn't do this, but was that our livelihood, we would lose our livelihood. Sure. If I told anyone, you know, like if sure. I outed him or if he, you know, if we, even if we got divorced, like there's not really room for that in, mm. you know, church leadership. And so it was this, like, we'll lose the house. We'll lose every, you know, mm. so I was scared. I was scared. Of course. And I needed a catalyst and he was either kind enough or dumb enough to give me one by mm. writing every detail of everything he'd ever done in a journal. That's right. And he says, accidentally leaving it on the dining room table mm. and hell yeah, I read that journal Yeah. and the disclosure, like it would have mm. been bad enough. It was just, if it was just everything I knew about all written out in a timeline, like yeah. I would have been, I would have been shaken like oh look mm. at what you have accepted in your life but it was that plus a lot of other stuff and I was like oh my gosh thank you for this grenade I'm pulling the pin yes we're yes. done that's it and we never I remember the same roof again I remember I remember that exact thing remember that time and it was for me it was a relief uh-huh yeah it, I, of course I, it was mm-hmm. oh my god of course it was my gosh and now because Kristen and I well really all three of us but as it relates to you, we've had the opportunity to know you before, during, and after. Yes. And so we're like, there she is. There she is. Yeah. We're we're, we're, there. You were all along, like out you came and this is the best you and we're going to, okay. We're going to get to best use. We're going to get to best us's and all that. We're going to get there, but thank you for walking through that, Jamie, because (sighs) that internal processing and dialogue that you're alone in. I mean, you can talk to people about it, but it's yours. It is yours to decide. It is yours to decide. This is my boundary. It's, oh, this is where I'm at. This is what I will no longer tolerate. This is what I deserve. And I think that came, started coming in for us too. Like, wait, what do I actually deserve here? Um, Kristen, can you, can you walk through your sort of portion there? Yeah. Although I want to comment on something that uh-huh. I, that I just thought of as we were talking about this, that I think is really relevant to people listening, which is we're very close. And, mm-hmm. and the three of us have talked about everything, mm-hmm. but all three of us were holding back the full right. mm-hmm. truth of our marriage mm-hmm. from even our friend group. You are all right. Of our close friends. Yep. That's and right. I think that that is something that a lot of people do. Um, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell why I did it. I mean, number mm-hmm. one, I felt like if I let, let that genie out of the bottle, I couldn't put it back in. Yeah. So if I told everybody the real story of how bad it was, I would probably have to do something. Like it's Mm -hmm. one thing to know yourself. It's another thing to hear it told out loud. I'm saying that just to say, I wish I would have been more honest early on. Mm -hmm. And that's a commitment that I've made to myself is I'm not going to protect or hide in relationships anymore. And don't you think also that there is something baked into that reluctance to be genuine, uh, even with, uh, I can speak for myself, even with myself, like I, some of those yes. lies I reserved for my own self, Oh, for sure. like, cause I just wanted the story to be so different and I yeah. wanted what I wanted. Um, but I think also, 
uh, for me, at least a big part of being unwilling to, um, literally steer into the curve in a a hundred percent genuine way is that it's embarrassing. So like it's it's embarrassing. It's you're humiliated. And so you're, it's just like, God, after all my training, (laughs) this is where, why am I here? Like, yeah, I, I wasn't supposed, this wasn't supposed to be my story. And what did I do wrong? Um, how could I have been everything prettier, (laughs) all of it, what, what went wrong in the bedroom, everything. Like it was so humiliating and I like, didn't even want my people to know. Yeah. I didn't want that. I didn't want you to know that bit of sadness and loneliness and absolute terror too, because when it's, when you're in it, you're like, it's terrifying. Like, what is, what do I, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know if, is this fixable? I don't know who can help me. Um, And so that sense of like shame around it too, I think keeps us quiet. And I too wish I could have gone back and really like shown up for my own self better. Like just as hard as that would have been. And frankly, that would have been me showing up for Brandon better too. Mm -hmm. Like we, everyone loses when we just lay it down. When we just yeah. roll over and lay it down, there's zero winners in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, okay, back to you, Kristen, because thank you for pointing that out. I, I wish that I better understood the harm of protecting at all costs, you know, yeah. because as you said, it, it, no one wins from yeah. that. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the, the kind of public thing, that was very difficult for me. And I think a reason that I stayed married as long as I did is, I was so embarrassed to be divorced. I was so embarrassed. I mean, I just had so much shame around the idea of getting a divorce. And I was a marriage therapist and my ex was a marriage therapist. And, you know, as you said, I had put my family out online as, you know, this like happy family. Um, And so, you know, when things started getting bad, honestly, I stopped posting about my husband. Anyone who's yeah. paying a lot of attention <laughs> could see that yeah. he disappeared. That's right. Well, every breakup does go a little bit the same way. In yeah. That, like yeah. the first thing anybody does is sort of like roll back the photos. <laughs> yeah. They just start like yeah. slowly deleting, like, yeah. like an erosion. That went, yeah. that went down just farther and farther back in time. Oh, it's so true. People do yeah. some of the work for you that way. You're like, they'll just <laughs> say it. They'll just say it. You don't haven't seen any pictures of yours. That's your true. Husband, like, everything. Yeah. No, you uh, haven't. Let no, you things. haven't. But I did stay very private for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like my kids just needed that privacy. And so yeah. I didn't say anything online for like years. I mean, mm. by the time I announced our divorce, we were, we had been divorced for a while mm. and we had been living separately for even, and our, we had a very slow divorce. Yes, Not, you, you did. Know, it was like, let it be said. Years I'm like, come on, tick tock. Yes. Like what in the world, California? And then another year of him living in my back house. And, yeah. You're trying oh, and- to do it. You're trying to do this thing where you're like, okay, well we can co-parent. Exactly. Uh-huh. We can share space. We can do holiday. Like, yeah. You try. We Even tried. In our divorces, we tried to be good wives. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yes. We tried, but then I realized, oh my gosh, I have a, you know, basically a teenager living in my back house. I'm like raising uh-huh. children in a house with a, with a yeah. teenager in the back house being insane. But let it be said in your defense, and this is something that was different in your story than in mine and Jamie's, your kids were little. They were like, you, you had littles. Yeah. Uh, Jamie and I were on the back end of parenting. Yeah. Um, and so it, that's a different lift. Um, yeah. That is a, that requires a different level of um, cooperation that yeah. is it's required. It is absolutely. So you were just doing, you're doing your best yeah. to try to keep those best. channels open, but that's a mess. We are all covering a lot of ground in our own ways. We are. And so maybe that means it's time to get comfortable with some discomfort, which is good, except when it comes to things like our shoes. And there's just no room for that. You know that I've been a long time Rothy's girl in the shoes category from the very minute I put on their slip on sneakers. I've walked literally a million miles in their shoes and they've brought me tons of comfort, seriously. But when things are hard, the last thing we want is to feel uncomfortable in what we're wearing. Rothy's delivers 
super comfiness, but they look good too, you guys. We wanna feel cute and better. And also we don't want our feet to hurt, right? And it's not just sneakers at Rothy's. They have a whole slew of durable, classic and sustainably crafted styles for women and men, by the way, from flats to loafers, ankle boots, so much more. And they have stylish and washable handbags, wallets, other accessories. Did you know People Magazine recently named Rothy's best-selling shoe, The Point, the best flat for their 2021 Style Awards? That's so fun, right? So hit the new year in stride with a fresh pair of Rothy's. New customers get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash for the love. So that's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash for the love. If you are a parent or know a parent, which is like uh, all of us, you know that we want the best for our kids. Sometimes that looks like supporting the little scientists and makers and crafters and builders and chemists in the making, um, which is why I love what they're doing over at KiwiCo. They deliver boxes to your door that open up whole new worlds for kids of all ages. Their seriously fun hands-on projects include engineering and mechanics behind everyday objects, the science and chemistry of cooking, the geography and culture from new places and brand new art and design techniques and more. They have so many hands-on experiences that spark curiosity and inspire creativity. Uh, we have a KiwiCo subscription for my nephews and they go crazy for them. Um, this is also a great gift idea for friends with kids. And just so you know, this is not like crafting 101 with glue and string, okay? These are real deal, legit projects from KiwiCo. They're not messing around with their huge array of engineering, science, and art crates. So redefine learning with play. Explore hands-on projects that build creative confidence and problem-solving skills with KiwiCo. You guys can get 50% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with the code for the love at kiwico.com. So that's 50% off your first month at kiwico.com, promo code for the love. Can we talk a little bit about fielding everybody's reactions? Um, and I'd like to talk about, because this is never like, there's a lot of shrapnel around a divorce. It isn't just us and our ex-husbands. It is everyone. It is yeah. the children that we have together. It is uh, how many times have I come to you and like been like, well, now I have an in-law situation that I don't who who what's the rules? You know, yeah. like where where are the what's the textbook here? We have if two sets of families that have been together for almost three decades. Like yeah. that's a long time. That's a long history. We've got the friend group. What do we do with our friends? Who yeah. do we get? Who gets yeah. who? <laughs> like, yeah. do we have to put that in the divorce agreement? We have church, like who leaves or maybe we both leave. Um, so can we talk about that messy mess of the, the now it's done. We did it. We did the hard thing. We made the hard decision or it was made for us either way. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're just on the other side of divorce and all of a sudden it's a whole new earthquake. Like it's just a completely different sea change that right in the midst of our absolute like grief and exhaustion and just complete trauma in yeah. a lot of cases. Now, everybody around us is starting to fall apart too, because this has affected them. Let's, let's, let's go there. Let's talk about that, that piece of the divorce puzzle. Cause I actually think this is a huge deterrent for people who know their marriages are dead, but they're thinking, but the kids, yeah. but our friends, but the life, like I get it. That was a huge yeah. deterrent for me. Mm -hmm. Massive. I, divorce is a huge trauma. I mean, it affects every single lane of your life. And I, I yeah. get so frustrated by these memes that talk about like the easy way out of divorce. Oh, it, that's not so real. Not easy. It's so yeah. horrible. It's so hard. It's horrible. And what you're describing, I mean, you're basically anyone in a situation who is contemplating divorce is staring down two terrible options. It's an option of staying in a marriage where there might be betrayal, God knows what abuse, or walking down a path of like, all of a sudden your entire life implodes. And, yeah. you know, people are weird about divorce. They are yeah. friends you've had for a long time, get real skittish and real funny. People act like it's contagious people, you know, I think that, you know, mm. for me, I, I experienced certain friends kind of backing away because it was like, 
this makes me uncomfortable because then I have to confront my own bad yeah. marriage, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't oh, want to look yeah. at it. Yeah, um, yeah. And then we had the weird experience too of like, you know, we had a, a pretty friendly divorce and he did, he lived in my back house for a while. We have young kids, so we've had to do that. You know, we, yeah. we have to stay, we don't have to, but we have tried to stay connected and, you know, we would have friends that would be like, well, you know, I'm not sure who to invite. And we're like, you can invite both of us. Like we mm. see each other every day. Mm -hmm. We can be at a social event at the same time, mm. but it's almost like friends felt like they needed to choose a side. And we're like, you don't need, you don't need to do that. Like we can mm. both show up, but people got, uh, although weird. I will just say as a counterpoint, I did not feel that way. I do yeah. not feel that way now, yeah. which yeah. I don't invite and us you both. Shouldn't. Bro, leave me off. Like totally. I am not, nope, not coming to yeah. the same party. So, yeah. and but I, again, we're, I was in a different space than you, Kristen, yeah, Jamie. Very different. I was going to say, I will push back. Uh, well, because that works for you guys, but yeah. I went into my divorce totally feeling the same way. Like our friends don't have to choose like, no, we'll be fine. It'll be fine. And I, I honestly, for five minutes thought that we would be able to do holidays together. Oh, we mm. did one. It was an utter disaster. It was mm -hmm. awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, that's not going to work. Yeah. And I really was trying so hard to be that gracious. Like, no, people don't have to choose. Like they can love him and love me at the same time. And then over time, mm. I have completely flipped the script on that. I mm. feel like you better choose. You, you're going to have to choose. If you know, if my good friends and my mm. family members or extended family members, they know yeah. what happened in the midst of my marriage yeah. They should not want to be friends with him. Mm. Yeah. Like as a friend, like mm. I don't want to be friends with your exes. I don't, yeah. I want to slash their tires. <laughs> Likewise. You know, like I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't want to be friends <laughs> yeah. with you. And oh. mm -hmm. I also don't want my friends to be friends with my ex. Uh -huh. Like mm -hmm. I get you in the divorce. He can, uh -huh. if, if people pick him, I'm fine with that. Like yeah. you're not going to hurt my feelings. If that is your jam and you want to go hang out with them. Cool. But uh -huh. I'm no longer going to hang out with you. Mm. Like, it's just, it, it sounds so mm. mean, but it's just sort no. of like, I don't want to be friends with people who hurt my friends. Mm. You know, there isn't a single singular script here. Right. Uh, I'm thinking like my brain is giving me examples of other divorced people who have at least on paper, again, we see what everybody wants us to see, mm -hmm. but appeared to have like stayed wildly connected and, and in great harmony. And I think in some cases that's true because totally. there's no one divorce, like there's no yeah. one reason for it. There's no one path through it. But I think what I like about this conversation is just saying, again, we weren't taught to believe in ourselves. We weren't taught to trust our own instincts. We weren't taught to, um, to protect our own boundaries and our own um, sense of like security and well being and safety in our lives. Um, but now that we know that we can do that, your instinct will tell you what to do. If, if it is safe and healthy and reasonable for you to stay like in a pretty, pretty working relationship with your ex and even like in social ways, great. Y your heart will lead you right. If it isn't, believe yourself. Yeah. Totally. Believe yourself as we kind of like start to land it here. I thank again for the millionth time. If you ever get sick of me telling you how much I love you both and appreciate you, well, it's too bad. Um, so for the millionth time, I looked to you. At, you were you were ahead of me on this path holding a lantern. And I was behind you, but I needed that light. And that very much includes what I want to, finish here, which is like for people listening who are either staring down an impending divorce that maybe only they know about who knows, or they're in the messy middle of it all. And it's just trauma and tears everywhere. There is life after divorce. And from what I can tell the view here is great. And so I just, can we go there? Can you talk about what your lives have looked like? post-divorce because you're ahead of me here. I'm just a little behind, um, but I'm coming, you know, I'm coming we know. and what, I, I, I don't know how else to say this. I hope this doesn't sound gross, but really, and truly the gifts that are embedded in divorce. Mm -hmm. Can, can we talk about that? 
Yes. Go, Jamie. Well, Did you? Say, s- uh-huh. Well, I, I will say Kristen actually was a little ahead of me. And that was the That's same true. thing. It was like, we were just this little like yeah. soldiers in the night. You're right. <laughs> like, You're right. <laughs> one after the other. And it gave me so much uh, strength and hope watching someone yeah. kind of go before me and go like, okay, totally. Okay. Like this is, this uh-huh. is how Kristen did it. And we would, uh-huh. kind of, we would talk, talk like, yep. how are you going to, whatever, how are you going to do this? Totally. Do that? And it was so helpful. But um, one of the things for me that was th- the most freeing thing for me was that inside of my marriage, what I did to survive was I shut down my emotions. Yeah. Like I just turned off. I just, I couldn't, it was too painful mm-hmm. to exist in emotions. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I just turned it off. I just kind of like everything was tamped down. And when I got divorced, when, when actually before I got divorced, when he, the day he moved out, I was like, okay, um, mm-hmm. let's just turn that back on. <laughs> like feelings I felt. Yeah. Like what I, what I started to discover as I was going through therapy and, yeah. um, and just kind of like getting excited about dating and the, yeah. and like imagining a future that I'd never really given myself permission to imagine before I started, I just had big feelings. Yeah. Like, like I just started feeling my feelings and it was really cool. Yeah. And it was honestly a little bit scary for me. Like I was mm-hmm. just like, this has been tamped down for a long time. And I remember ha- having a conversation with one of my girlfriends and I was like, this is weird, but I think mm-hmm. I am feeling jealous. I had, jealous I knew you were, I knew you were going to say that example. I remember when you told us this, these weird, I was like, this is weird. I'm having this feel like yeah. I've never felt this before. Yeah. And she just started cackling and she's yeah. like, Oh, this is because you're feeling feelings. <laughs> Yay. The you real, get them all. I got them all. Yeah. Yes. And the real catalyst for that was falling in love. Like, yeah. I met a boy. You did. Or it was helpful to me. I should say for unlocking all of these feelings that I had not allowed myself to feel in so yeah. long. Cause when you're in a lot of pain, it's just easier to, you can't just shut down your pain. That's right. You kind of have to tamp it all down. Hmm. So that was for me, like the biggest, like, wow, I had no idea this was coming. And it's not even, I mean, I, I'm in madly in love. I have this awesome person in my life, but it's not even that it's that hmm. I get to feel it like that. Yeah. That, that exists it. in me and, right. and I had ignored it for so long. Yeah. This is you and he is getting the you that he deserves mm-hmm. and you are getting the partner that you deserve and you're your best self. Like, but you did that. That was your work. Like right. that was, pre- that was pre Steve. Now, I did agree. he just set it on fire out into the atmosphere? Of course he did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We had to look at your moony face all the time. Like That's looking true. at your phone. I'm so moony. I know. We're like, like, good Lord. Gosh. I'm just swooning over here. I'm just swooning. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and this, it, the thing is like, I had done so much work in my own self. That's right. Grown That's so much. Point. And I came into the dating world, a grown ass woman who knows yes, she what she, who she is and what she wants. Yes. And then I attracted a grown ass man That's who right. knows who he is and what he wants. That's right. When you're healthy, you will attract healthy people it's and you so will great. see unhealthy people as super gross. Yeah. Uh, you've yes. told me this about a hundred times and I like want to cross stitch it on the pillow. Cause you know, I worried about my own self. Like, well, I did, well, didn't have a good radar the first go around and I just made a decision, but I'm not 18. I'm not 18 and I'm like trustworthy. I'm trustworthy in my own life. And so thank you for saying that. That just because we made a decision that we would not make now, 25 years ago, does not mean that's still the way we're making decisions right. um, or even who we are. Thank God. Right. Um, Cause you know, I didn't even drink to my thirties. You guys, who, where, what I lost a decade there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Kristen, I'm a therapist. You know, it, it's easy to say, Oh, we just chose randomly because we were so young, but we also choose people Um, when we're not healed, we choose people that we are going to try to heal our own hurts with. And I can Mm -hmm. absolutely look at my ex and say, and, and then look at my family of origin and see how that was like a puzzle piece of me, you know, marrying the issues that were present in my family of origin. Yeah, I did it. And both my sisters did it. And Mm -hmm. all three of us married very similar guys, you know, with a lot of misogyny, a lot of under-functioning, um, a lot of, Anyway, um, and I remember watching one of my sister's kids 
get in a very similar serious relationship. And Mm -hmm. I, that was a real turning point for me of like, we're modeling this for our kids Mm -hmm. that, you know, people can use us, walk all over us. Like, you know, so when I saw a, you know, next generation following the exact same patterns, I was like, I can't model Mm -hmm. this for my kids. I cannot stay in this marriage and let them think that all of this is normal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I do feel good that I have shown my kids, like, you know, when thing, when someone is mistreating you, you can leave, you don't Mm. have to stay and be desperate in a relationship. Um, And then I also think in a weird way, it, it has brought me closer to my kids. I mean, it was definitely like a kind of like us against the world for a little bit, you know? And I mean, when I, and, and another thing that people need to understand about divorce also is in addition to all the things that implode, it's generally for most people financially devastating. Sure. Of course. And and you cannot minimize that part. And many people are stuck in there just because divorce is untenable financially. You're so right. Mm -hmm. I was financially devastated. I, Mm. and I, I still have a lot of privilege. So I, but you know, I moved back into a house that didn't fit all of us. I was sharing a bedroom with a seven-year-old. Like I shared a room, Mm -hmm. a bedroom with a child. Mm -hmm for a long time because I couldn't afford a bigger house. Um, but, and uh, you know, single mom working full time, it was like all hands on deck, like, Hey, everybody, you all need to learn how to cook. Everybody Mm -hmm. needs to learn. You know, it it was almost like we became roommates because I didn't have a co-parent and I have primary custody of my kids. I have them most of the time. Um, but we, we grew close, you know, like Mm. I, I wouldn't have happened. Um, in my marriage. And then like Jamie said, there was a fog over me when I was married. There was Mm. a fog. That's the only way I can explain it. It was just, it was emotionally stunted, intellectually stunted. You just, you know, in order to maintain that equilibrium, you do kind of have to tamp everything down. Yeah. And I mean, I just completely agree with Jamie too, is like when that is lifted, when that tension and that resentment and, you know, all of that, that is brewing and the secrets when all of that is just lifted, there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot Mm. of emotional freedom there. Mm. I love it. It's so great. Uh, you're both so great and your happiness makes me happy and your wholeness makes me happy. And it's been a real guidepost for me. Um, and you both said some really like hard things to me along the way. Um, cause I was still trying to shake the life. Um, both of you knew have known me for so long and way before I was still, there were parts of me, I was still trying to keep in the deep freeze or even explain or justify. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can just kind of remember, <laughs> I remember just you observing what you saw in me before divorce, when we we're all together with all the men and you're like, where, where, where do you go? Mm -hmm. You like, it's confusing for us because we know you, we know you, who you really are. And then we're all together and you just, where are you? You just disappear out of your soul. And I'm like, you become a spotlight. You become a spotlight for another human when we were, I just didn't ever know that partner. It was yeah, it's just like, yeah, just shrinking, shrinking, shrinking to make room. Well, spotlight for you. And, cl- and cleanup crew. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's my specialty. You know, at the end of every podcast episode, you know, I always ask my guests, what is saving their life right now? For me, that answer, especially during the absolute worst moments of sort of my divorce and the, the shift of my family was therapy, of course. Because divorce is devastating. It's messy and it's difficult and it's confusing and disorienting and you feel every feeling and some that you didn't even know to feel. And it's also isolating and lonely. And so whether divorce is a part of your story or you're walking through something else that's hard, this is my little nudge for you toward therapy. I have always met with my therapist online, which is why I love BetterHelp so much. It's it's professional online therapy, all done through their virtual platform. Like your therapist literally meets you where you are. And BetterHelp really prioritizes matching you with the right licensed therapist. You walk through a bunch of questions to identify the specific pain points and sticky areas that are burdened to you, like divorce being a big one, if that applies to you. And so here's the thing. 
You can always request a new counselor at any time with no additional charge if it's not a good match. And because it's all online, BetterHelp offers not only convenient and accessible options, but it's also affordable. Um, plus, there's no waiting time. You can start communicating with a BetterHelp therapist in under 24 hours. So you guys, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Okay. Join more than a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash for the love. Okay. Let's do this. Let's just wrap it with this last question. You know, Barbara's question. So let's just hear from both of you. What's saving your life right now? Hmm. Kristen, you got one? Oh gosh. I knew this question was coming and then I completely forgot And you're still blank. Jamie, are you ready? And we'll give her a minute to think yeah, while she's yeah, not just, listening to you. This is sweaters and cold. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. I already mentioned it. Damn yeah. it. Here for it. I just, yeah. I, I, we finally got fall. I live in Northern California. So we have like two weeks of fall and it's spectacular. Yeah. And I left basically on the first day to go to Austin and be with oh, you where it was yeah. 90 degrees. I'm so sorry. 10,000% humidity. God, I, I'm still, so, I have such regrets. It's so Texas was there. so naughty. I don't know how you live, but so, yeah. So I came home and I immediately yeah. just like put on uh-huh. a fat sweater. I wear, I have a different fat sweater to wear. Every yes. Day. Yes. It's, it's barely chilly enough, but I will take it. Drizzly oh, the skies and envy that I feel is so deep. It's so complete. Yeah. So that's no, you, you're in your bed sweater. in your cozy sweater. I am literally like in jean shorts. Oh my like, God. Can you see this? <laughs> like. I can't, we can't get out. Like we can't get out under a cozy blanket. And I, yeah, I'm just like, okay, keep me chilly and put me in a warm sweater all day. I love it. All right. Whatever. Kristen. All right. I have mine. I found it right here. Okay. Oh, hey. Oh my God. Kristen. Kristen. So good. I don't have mine to hold up. Uh, So good. So if you guys don't know, she's magic. Kate Ballard, her first book was, um, everything happens for a reason and other lies I've loved. And then this one is no cure for being human. She just, she's so good at, yeah. at just tamping down the narratives of mm-hmm. toxic positivity and, totally. you know, just helping you feel better about being human. I mean, I know. so good. She's I don't know who funny. could not benefit from that book. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. She's funny and she's like a legitimately good writer. Uh-huh. You know, some people have something, they have a story to tell and they just put the words on the paper mm-hmm. and some people are a, they're writers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's a writer's writer, She's a writer, funny, good. Yeah. A yeah, little a mean, person. mean in the ways we like. Yeah. Oh, good choice. Yeah. Good choice. Both of you guys read no cure for being human in a cozy sweater. And yes. you'll just like, we I saved mean, so many lives today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I know you've saved mine and that's the damn truth. So I, um, love you both so much. You're just never be rid of me. It'll be so exhausting for all your days. Get excited. Um, Our relationship thank- is so ridiculously mutual. All right. On that note, on that good note. All right. Um, I'll send, you know, all my people to you. Like I always do. You're the best. Love you both. Love you. Well, I told you that it was all good. It was in there. <laughs> that is easily the most I have ever talked about my divorce in public by a long shot. Um, and so I'm so grateful for my friends who have really, they, they made a way for me. Um, they were, they really, they mentored me and taught me and grabbed me by my little hands and pulled me forward. And, and I get to watch their happiness just absolutely shine right now. And it thrills me so much um, because I am well on my way right? I'm going to join their ranks. I've, I've already joined them. Um, and so my hope for my own future is sky high. If I don't even think we mentioned any of it, but if you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we'll have this episode. We'll have all the show notes and I'll have all of Jamie and Kristen's stuff, their books, their links, their social handles, um, their websites, just everything. Cause you should, you would want more of both these girls in your life. Trust me. Um, <clears throat> they are good as freaking gold. Um, hope that this series is, I hope that you are loving it as much as I am. 
I really appreciate having a listening community that isn't afraid of hard topics and doesn't push back, but rather says, okay, let's go. Let's go in. Um, You know that on my end, me and my peeps, we are going to put the best leaders and thinkers in front of you that we can find, um, people that we trust. Um, and therefore we feel safe enough to bring you into the conversation. And I think we're all going to be better for it and for having face down what we would rather avoid. Anyway, more to come. So, um, share this episode with anybody who might need it. And I'm guessing that's a lot. Um, thanks you guys for being here and I'll see you next week.